I'm Peter Bergen of the New America Foundation. We're here to discuss the recent historic elections in Pakistan. Uh, I couldn't imagine a finer panel. Um, to the far right is Shramala Chowdhury, who was uh, NSC Director for Pakistan, worked for Richard Holbrook, uh, a fellow here at New America, works at the Eurasia Group. Uh, next to her is Andrew Wilder, who runs the Af Afghanistan and Pakistan program at USIP, has spent many years living in both Afghanistan and Pakistan, wrote a brilliant piece for us. Uh, Shamila, by the way, has also written brilliant pieces for the AFPAC channel every week on the election as it was uh, in the, both the run-up and the sort of uh, post-game analysis. Andrew also wrote a very good piece for us on the AFPAC channel. Uh, next to Andrew is Malik Siraj Akbar, who is the Washington DC editor of the Baluk Howl, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, the first online English newspaper in Baluchistan. And next to me is uh, Simbul Khan, who's the uh, Pakistan fellow at Woodrow Wilson Center for the past year. He's also the director of the Afghanistan Central in, uh, Asia for the Institute for Strategic Studies in Islamabad. And she's working on a book, U.S.-Pakistan Security Ele Relations, 2001 to 2011. That ends right at the worst moment. <laughs> <laughs> I cover the worst moment. So uh, do you want to start, Simbul? Yeah, and sure. we'll just move along this way. Right. Um, well, uh, you know, basically, I think just before the election, there were a lot of discussion in DC and many of those forums I participated on. And basically, most of the discussion revolved around this idea as to why are these elections considered, being considered landmark elections? What is the change that they're supposed to be ushering in? And there was a lot of split opinion coming out. Um, analysts were split about it. Most of the analysis revolve around, the differences revolve around how the situation on the ground, the conditions on the ground were being read. Those who were skeptical uh, of these elections being a huge change of course for Pakistan cited some of the continuities. They talked about, say, you know, the, it's the same two big parties that we've seen. We've seen Nawaz Sharif and we've seen PPP. They're the same people who had had a play in um, in the 90s, nothing happened. The military very much still, you know, kind of running the security policy. No change there. Um, and and you know, the the basically the the parliamentarians or the policymakers had enough vested interest not to bring around the, the economic change. They were basically pointing out that even if you do have a new parliament, it is going to be the same faces, and they have too much of the vested interest supporting them, there's not going to be any drastic change on the economic front, which is what Pakistan needs for a real landmark course correction. And of course, the people who, who were a little more hopeful cited discontinuities. They, they were saying that, look, you know, there are structural changes on the ground. There is a new vibrant media, which was never there. Judicial activism was being cited. How the ECP this time got structured, you know, the institutional build, building that was going on in Pakistan, this is new. And, you know, and also the Pakistani internal environment has changed drastically. The militancy, the internal challenges, this is the first time. So they were citing these uh, uh, discontinuities with the past. Post-elections, how does the situation look? Uh, for me, I think when I look at it, I don't think elections are a process. Elections are basically an event. So to think that, you know, just an event, even if it has these new elements, I, you know, you, I understand the skeptic's point of view. I mean, even if you have these new elements, it's just an event. For these processes to go forward and fold forward, we would really have to see a lot more happen for Pakistan to go on to the course correction that we are all seeking for Pakistan. But looking at the other side of the picture for me, the, the people with hope and the one, you know, who were talking about this new kind of a hope on the scene. Um, there is, has been this huge element of surprise in these elections. And uh, surpa surprise, although doesn't really mean, uh, doesn't really mean or signify radical change, but it also signifies some unpredictability, and which is telling you that there are elements on the ground which are moving through certain changes or certain kind of a, a restructuring is happening on the ground, which can only mean two things: either the situation is going to go towards change or chaos. We hope that it is going to be change and not chaos. What are the surprises that I'm talking about? I think the first big surprise that a lot of analysts were prediction that was being made that is going to be a split parliament. 
almost invariably everyone including myself believed that this time the elections is going to bring about a split parliament. Why was this view? The view was basically based on, uh, based on the older ideas about politics in Pakistan where we did not see the voting patterns reflecting the anti-incumbency, where voters were not really sensitive to the bad performance of the government. This is showing us that this has changed. People are not block, voting, block votes are not happening. There is huge anti-incumbency against the uh, PPP, you know, that has happened. So that, that, that definitely was the, another surprise. The other surprise which a lot of people have talked about and is that a lot of people predicted, including Imran Khan and the PTI, that they're going to win 60, 60 uh, seats um, in Punjab and that is going to create the split parliament, the split vote. That hasn't happened and why, why is that significant and why that is important? A uh, lot of people didn't predict how colossal the loss of PPP is going to be in, in Punjab, which was nobody really predicted how big their loss is going to be in Punjab, which again points out to the change of political change environment, voter, voting patterns, changes happening on the ground. The third surprise for me is some people who like me, predicted that Imran Khan PTI is going to win 15 votes or, or less. So, yeah, that was my prediction. I didn't really think that things have changed enough. I felt older party structures like PMLN, like PPP, still being able to, uh, you know, kind of get the vote out and get that translated into seats and votes. But then again, it tells you that the situation has changed so much that Imran's message of change, Imran's outreach to the, to the youth outreach, mobilizing the urban youth was a huge change so that happened and then of course the the finally i'd, I'd also say is the militants the, the challenge of the militants there was so much blood shed before the elections people predicted that the militant challenge is going to have a huge impact we saw that it really didn't have such a huge impact uh, on the elections although it was there it it affected PPP, ppps and anp's um, ability to go out and campaign but it didn't really change the, the the outcome of the elections but going forward then you know keeping these surprises going forward we've we've seen this new uh, um, uh, new structure that is thrown up by the elections pmln has won this uh, massive big solid majority in the center but it faces then as i as i said earlier election is an event they have gotten that they, this government going forward faces about two three huge challenges the first is they they, they came on the platform of uh, economy, Econo um, you know, basically trying to change around, restructure a very stagnant economy. And I think they're going to face uh, their, their fundamental two, three very quick challenges. First is the fiscal balance. I think that is a challenge that they're going to face immediately. I don't know how it's going to work out. Um, the F NFC award, which is the new structure that is linked to the 18th Amendment, where um, uh, the revenues are being divided now more revenues are being given to the provinces also restricts the fiscal space that the center government will have and Nawaz Sharif is going to come into the center with that kind of a limited space as compared to what they had in the 90s and um, so how they maneuver that that's going to be very difficult to find that uh, fiscal space um, and then um, it and the thing this another thing is that having a heavy mandate in the center for Nawaz Sharif is going to be different than having a heavy mandate in Punjab. They have won this election on the relatively better performance in Punjab. And, and Punjab, when, when people look at all of Pakistan, usually everybody says Punjab ge definitely generally functions better. Its indicators are better than the rest of the country. But this time for Nawaz Sharif to translate these five years into success in the next elections, they will have to show uh, a, a more kind of a, a, a broader push, basically taking most of the provinces along as they move forward. Just having a successful Punjab government will not be enough. So that would also mean that he will have to work far more closely with the other three provinces, and especially now PTI coming into the KPK province and uh, PPP and MQM in Karachi also are going to challenge PMLN how to take these provinces along, how to work these provinces along. And then on uh, secu basically uh, security, security, internal security, it's a huge issue. We saw just it's framed the internal security challenge of the militants to the elections around the election time, frames this 
uh, existential threat that Pakistan, internal threat that Pakistan is facing. And uh, Nawaz Sharif has talked about it, their party has talked about it, but the promises have been very vague. Uh, it's not just anti-militancy policy that they, he has to be far more clearly enunciating, which they haven't enunciated. Just reaching out and saying we want to talk to the militants is not really a strategy, and uh, which which a PPP government did also, and ANP did in KP. We saw last five years also, and we know it never really went anywhere. So I don't know what they're bringing on the table, which is going to be new. Other than that, also just law enforcement basic law enforcement inside the country, it's abysmal. Um, and I, I think yesterday or today, uh, the, the, the organization for journalists has come out with this, uh, global organization for journalists has come out with this huge report, really uh, basically um, saying how, how uh, insecure journalists are in Pakistan. And that uh, basically Pakistan is one country where the journals are at the greatest threat. They've taken a few cases and made case studies of that. So, and basic that for me is linked to basic law enforcement issues and how governance and law enforcement they attack and how they respond to that. That's going to be a big challenge and foreign policy. Um, finally, he made the first statement Nawaz Sharif has made is about reaching out to India and basically, you know, moving towards this reproachma with India that we have seen uh, past two, three years, taking it forward. And uh, but taking it forward would also mean finally granting India the MFN status, the most favored nation status, which has been hanging uh, by a thread for for some time. And so. Basically, making an enunciation is something else, but actually actualizing those policies because even within his own party structures, within his supporters in Punjab, there are some who talk about the NTBs or the non-tariff barriers issue, which is linked to this MFN with India, and which this this non-tariff barriers is used as an excuse to delay that uh, movement in that front. So, really, actually actualizing all these issues will be important. Yeah, I think it's very ironic whenever Pakistan goes for elections, uh, the, uh, the slogan is different. In 2002, for example, when elections were held, General Musharraf signed the National Reconciliation Ordinance with Benazir Bhutto, which, uh, gave off, uh, a lot, which dropped a lot of corruption charges, like uh, corruption that was committed in the 1990s, billions of rupees which were embezzled by the politicians. All those corruption charges were dropped and the elections were held. They say now we are having elections in, uh, we, that we had elections in Pakistan. The slogan is of talking to Taliban, which has surprised a lot of people in Pakistan, particularly, I mean, the liberals in Pakistan, uh, what it means to talk to the Taliban and uh, whether or not the, uh, what democracy means for Pakistan, whether the Pakistani democratic government is going to talk to human rights abusers, people who uh, attacked schools, hundreds of schools which were bombed, you know, uh, people who attacked polio workers. So there's a, a lot of insecurity uh, among the pa uh, Pakistani people. But uh, Pakistanis generally uh, have an ability to forgive and forget, you know. Uh, the, the, we don't have to be, be surprised considering the uh, past history of Pakistani politics. But I'll just go a little uh, back uh, during the election campaign. Uh, I call it like one of the most unfair elections in Pakistan's history, considering the fact that uh, for the first time in our history, there were massive attacks on election rallies of three politi politi political parties, three liberal political parties, uh, the P Pakistan People's Party, the Mutaida Qaumi movement in Karachi, and uh, uh, the MQM, uh, M Karachi, and ANP in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. These were the political parties which were, uh, which were actively a part of the war on terror, which actively supported the Americans uh, in hunting down the Osam Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and, and Taliban. So it was very selective. In Pakistan's history, we have had a lot of time. Uh, you know, when uh, 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 opponents were defeated or uh, you know outvoted, but for the first time, it was you know criminalized. Uh, election can candidates were attacked, and uh, it, it was clear that elections were being engineered. You know, certain political part. Uh, it was the way it was being paved for certain political parties, such as the Muslim League and the Pakistan mm -hmm. Tariq in Saf, which were anti-US, anti-drones, and which made a commitment to the people of Pakistan that they would end the war on terror. So this, this was basically you know, one of the problems in Pakistan's history. And when you talk to a lot of uh, you know, uh, people, they just say, well, the People's Party did not do well. You know, the MQM did not do well. The ANP did not do well. So this is what they deserved. But 
when you look at Pakistan's history through, throughout our election history, no ruling party has ever stretched the comeback. So it was expected that the People's Party would lose, the NP or the you know uh, MQM would lose. It's not an excuse. I think uh, the worst thing is they say. Uh, Everything is funny as long as it happens to you. But you know when it hap so what we are sitting right now, you know, it's a trend. A lot of people are laughing at the MQM or at the ANP that you know well they deserved it. But I think uh, you don't know what happens five years down the line. This trend of attacking election campaigns, you know, attacking political rallies will go down in Pakistan's history. And next year, maybe you know, next time when we hold elections, uh, maybe the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz would be equally unpopular and. Uh, People would believe that the solution to this problem is attacking their candidates, bombing their, you know, rallies. So this is not a very positive omen for Pakistani politics. Secondly, when we look at the uh, results of the elections, you see Pakistan, the Federation of Pakistan is so Punjab dominated that if you combine all of the National Assembly seats from the rest of the three provinces in the federal capital, Punjab still dominates the most of the seats. So it's very hard to understand, you know, uh, what is going to happen to the, uh, to, the, to, to, to the future of the government. Because uh, Pakistan right now faces multiple crises, multiple challenges. And the epicenter of none of these challenges is the Punjab province. The Punjab did not experience all of these attacks, for example. Uh, not a single election campaign was bombed in Punjab. No candidate was att attacked in the Punjab. Similarly, like uh, when you look at the issues like the drones, you know, talking to the Taliban, MQM, the insurgency in Balochistan, these are all outside the Punjab. Now, Pakistan is left with a leader who is uh, who has limited exposure, uh, who has shrunk into Punjab's leader, you know, uh, who does not have popularity in the Sindh to talk to the MQM to resolve the, uh, you know, conflict uh, or ethnic violence in Karachi. He has no popularity in the province of Balochistan where there is a separatist insurgency. Uh, similarly, he has no control over the, you know, the, the militant groups uh, uh, back in Waziristan or in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And uh, w when we look at the history, I think uh, uh, the way Pakistani government has pledged to negotiate with Taliban, uh, it is not as if that the People's Party government did not try. In 2004, and 2005, and in 2006, they had separate deals with Naik Muhammad, with Baitullah Masood, and uh, with uh, Afiz Gul Bahadur. What happens, I think uh, this period is going to be taken by the, uh, by the Pakistani Taliban to refuel, to reorganize themselves and launch an offensive and cause problems for the central government. Uh, and overall, look at, uh, when we look at the results, I think this has regionalized Pakistani politics. In the past, we had political parties which had a broader reach outside, the, outside one province, like the uh, People's Party is generally considered to be the you know, home for the Sindhi voters, but it also did well in other provinces. But for the first time, we, say, we see that uh, politicians have gotten votes on ethnic lines, like People's Party has been confined to the Sindh, and the Muslim League has been confined to the Punjab. In Balochistan, ethnic nationalist groups have also won. So this is a new trend in Pakistani politics, and I think uh, there are going to be mo more challenges. And when you know, Pakistan talks of talking to uh, the Taliban, resolving, you know, uh, sitting with Taliban, calling them uh, our brothers, I think that in itself negates the uh, Pakistani claim of Malala Yousafzai being the Pakistani sister or Pakistani daughter. So o overall, uh, that simply uh, shows that the Pakistani government has no commitment in fighting the war on terror, which uh, eventually will, will be affecting Pakistan's relations with, the, with India. Because uh, if you want to resolve disputes with, with India, you also have to take the issue of lashkar e taiba very seriously. Uh, lashkar e Taiba's chief of his Saeed operates freely in Pakistan. The Americans even announced a bounty on him. He appears on television, talk shows. He, he's public. He's not hidden. Uh, so what is the Pakistan Muslim League government going to do about Hafiz Saeed? Whether, uh, because Nawaz Sharif takes uh, relationships with India very simplistically. He last year said at a uh, you know, uh, conference that, well, we eat the same food, the Indians eat the same food, so we are the same. But I think there is a larger security aspect attached to improvement of relations with Pakistan. There have been times Nawaz Sharif himself acknowledged that he was stabbed in the back by Musharraf uh, when he was talking to Prime Minister Vajpayee and uh, Musharraf endorsed the Kargil operation. So if Nawaz Sharif is taking an initiative improving diplomatic relations with you know, uh, Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh or the upcoming Prime Minister in India, 
But if there is one more attack like Mumbai, if there's one more attack on the Indian parliament, that has the capability of derailing the entire negotiation process with India. Similarly, uh, the, the, the new government, uh, as well as the PTI, has been talking about you know, bringing the, down, uh, the drones down, you know, ending cooperation with the United States. That uh, also will be uh, causing a lot of problems for the Pakistanis because the Pakistani government in itself does not have the capability of fighting the militants in Waziristan, does not have the will. And if uh, there is a detachment uh, against the drones, I think uh, the war on terror will uh, experience a setback. And uh, the uh, Pakistani Taliban will eventually turn their guns against Pakistani politicians. And as we saw some months back, you know, the way the Pakistani Taliban even threatened to attack Imran Khan. They said Imran Khan was a liberal, pro-Western. So, so one doesn't know what time the Taliban would, you know, reconfigure their enemies and how they would turn their guns against the Pakistani politicians. So uh, my concern is I think the new government intends to give in too much to, to the Pakistani Taliban. And overall, then there are other issues. Uh, uh, the way I said, like, you know, Pakistanis tend to forget a lot of things and they forgive a lot of things. But Nawaz Sharif is a politician who, in 1997, inducted the 13th Amendment in Pakistani parliament, where he wanted to bring Islamic Sharia in the country. He wanted to be named as the Amir al Momin in, in Pakistan. He was the chief minister of General Ziaullah during whose time, you know, Pakistani society was drastically radicalized. So it's a man who has been known for his corruption charges, but has never faced corruption charges, who, who has uh, passionately support radical Islam. So uh, within Pakistan, you know, what is Nawaz Sharif's or Imran Khan's policy towards blasphemy law is going to be? Uh, how are they going to protect the uh, religious minorities in Pakistan? How are they going to resolve the ethnic question, if particularly in the province of Balochistan? So these are all the challenges. I, I think uh, Nawaz Sharif will have to, a lot of people say, even I don't believe that Nawaz Sharif has become a more mature politician now. But I think Pakistani polity as a whole has to detach itself from ultra Islamic you know, mindset, whether it is uh, in terms of you know, reviving people's rights, giving equal rights to Pakistani citizens, whether it is to, you know, in terms of inform, uh, improving relations with the United States, with India. Pakistan has to take away the religious element from its policy, domestic and internal policies in order to open up. I think uh, it was Imran Khan's uh, slogan, actually, you know, a naya of Pakistan, a new Pakistan. But it's also a chance for Nawaz Sharif uh, to, dis, uh, to decide, Pakistan should not become another North Korea. Pakistan should not become an Iran, but rather Pakistan has to open up, liberalize, you know, improve relations. So it's a chance for Nawaz Sharif to build a new Pakistan too. Uh, thanks, Peter. Thanks for the invitation for joining today. Um, uh, several of the points I wanted to make have already been made, but uh, I thought I'd just sort of talk a little bit about what I think were some of the positives from the elections, some of the negatives, and then I think some of the future challenges. But um, Certainly amongst the positives, um, I would say was echoing what Symbol said, which is I was certainly also amongst those pundits who thought we'd have a hung parliament, and we don't. And I think that's a very positive development because at least gives an opportunity now for a government that has a pretty strong mandate to actually take some decisive action on many of the critical challenges facing Pakistan. Um, and now sort of the ball's in Nawaz Sharif's court to see if he delivers. Um, but he now has an incredible opportunity that I think none of us thought he would have um, before the election. Um, I think the second positive, I think, is the voter turnout issue, um, especially in a campaign that was very violent, and especially the militant violent and the calls on people to boycott the elections and threats for the attacks on election day for the turnout rate to go from 44% in 2008 to what was originally projected around 60%, but the final figures show it's probably closer to 55%. But that's still very good, especially because in the 1990s, we were seeing election after election turnout rates going down further and further until they were in the mid to low 30s. Um, Which is similar to the United States. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so 55 is good, and I think a very, a very positive <laughs> um, result. Um, and I think there, I think the um, Imran Khan and the PTI deserves credit for mobilizing a lot of new voters into the system. And of course, the question goes, if he mobilized so many voters, why didn't he do better? Um, but I think what happened is he did mobilize and it really forced some of the other parties to up their game and also get their own student wings more activated and their women's wings and get, and also just the, the media campaign. And, and, you know, this was sort of the whole era of um, uh, TV advertising sort of came of age in, for, in Pakistan for this election. And the role of the media, I think, also played a very significant role. Um, 
I would also say, from my perspective, these were relatively free and fair elections in terms of the state's responsibility for the elections. I think what was different in this election was the militants, anti-state actors, trying to uh, create a, a, a playing field that was not level. Um, in past elections, it was the state trying to uh, do it, playing that role. And I think that was a different f factor. But from my perspective, we had, compared to in previous elections, uh, an independent ele election commission that was perceived to be much more independent than previously. We also had the military very explicitly playing much more of a hands-off role than they have in past elections. And also, again, the role of the media, I think, in terms of increasing increased accountability and transparency in the elections also contributed to their, um, from my perspective, from <coughs> being uh, relatively free and fair. And then a fourth one I'd just point is, I think, a positive development, I think, will actually be returning to a genuine sort of parliamentary democracy again. I think we've had But the fact that President Zardari, as the uh, de facto head of the PPP, was, all, was the president, that real par power, civilian power, I should clarify, was more in the presidency than in the parliament, in the past government as well. And I think now with Nawaz Sharif returning as prime minister, uh, civilian power will actually be uh, in the parliament. Um, a couple of the negatives, the electoral violence one is, of course, the obvious one to point to. Um, um, Peter in the AFPAC channel printed uh, an article recently from one of my colleagues and another expert on, uh, who, on electoral violence pointing out that these aren't actually necessarily the most violent elections. That 2008 mm. was also a very violent election and you can quibble, you know, which was more, the end result is both were very violent. Um, but I think what was different again was the nature of the violence. In 2008 it was much more tr traditional party-based, uh, candidate-based violence. This one, the role of the militant groups actively targeting, as Malik pointed out, specific parties was a very disturbing feature uh, in terms of the nature of violence in, in this election. Um, and then the other one is also, as you touched on, the fact that we really no longer have a truly national party left in Pakistan. I mean, the Pakistan People's Party uh, since 1970 has historically played that role where it's actually one, you know, respectable numbers of votes in, in most provinces, if not all provinces. Um, but certainly in the big provinces of Punjab and Sindh, um, always, you know, a very competitive race. And now you have the PPP uh, really reduced to a party of interior Sindh, and you have, um, uh, you know, the, the PMLN of Nawaz, very, you know, as Altaf Hussain said, you know, called a Punjabi party. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, and I think that that's disturbing. I think that will be one of the challenges, uh, in, you know, coming up, you know, of, of, for the parties now is how do they actually, how does the PMLN, uh, you know, reach out and become more of a national party? What is the PPP going to do to try to, um, you know, it, I mean, to me, this is a period of sort of existential crisis for the PPP. Whether it can recover, I think, is a very open question. And, you know, um, and it comes to leadership, and I think that's where I, I lack some confidence. Um, uh, and there has been a tendency often in the PPP leadership to try to surround themselves by weak people and not wanting to see challenges. And this is, in the future of, I think, electoral politics in Pakistan, you can't just run it as a family affair. You actually have to rebuild a party structure. And I think that's one of the things PTI taught some of the parties in this uh, election, is that you, 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 know, you, you do need to start organizing. And so we'll, I think we're going to see what happens to the PPP in that regard. Um, well, I'm at it, I think another interesting development, I think, is MQM. I mean, I think for the first time in nearly 20 years, Altaf Hussain has actually had a little pushback in the Mahajra areas of Karachi. Um, and, you know, he's scrambling, there's party reorganization going on. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, there's a little bit of a wake up call for them as well as the PTI, you know, didn't do fabulously well in Karachi, but definitely put a dent into some of the MQM uh, vote bank there. Um, in terms of what next, um, I think the big issue is of what I've already alluded to. Now, what is Nawaz Sharif going to do with this, with this mandate? Um, we've talked about the perils of incumbency. Uh, that's not unique to Pakistan, but certainly in South Asia in general. In a patronage-based political system, incumbency is usually a disadvantage. Governments don't win back-to-back -back governments uh, elections. Um, I would say the exception, however, is Punjab, mm -hmm. where we had a PML government in Punjab and they won, came back with a much stronger victory at the provincial assembly elections in this election. So I think 
Um, but I think that's going to be the challenge. Can he now deliver? And, and I think it's going to be difficult because campaigns are when you make lots of promises and you raise expectations. I think he really ran on a campaign of promising a lot to turn around the economy in general, and I think the <laughs> energy crisis in particular. Um, but these are not problems that have quick solutions. <laughs> and not problems that necessarily have solutions in a five-year time frame. Even if you take a lot of the right decisions on the energy sector now, maybe 15 years from now we'll see uh, some of that paying off. Um, but you know, obviously it need needs to be done, but not necessarily big boat winners. So I think that's going to be one of the challenges. Of course, one of the other challenges is, is the tax to GDP ratio. I mean, one of the big crises in Pakistan is that no one, all those who should be paying taxes don't pay taxes. And, and you know, I think it, I have a hard time seeing how you're going to turn around the economic crisis unless you can uh, raise tax revenues. And, uh, and so I think that will be, again, something important to do, but not necessarily that something that's terribly going to be politically popular, certainly with political elites. Um, so I think there could be a short honeymoon period. I think that will be one of the challenges and delivering on these uh, high expectations. Um, that said, I think it's possible that the bar is quite low. <laughs> Maybe they just have to do better than the PPP. <laughs> um, and you know, so I think a few quick wins, and, and Nawaz Sharif has you know, past showed that he's pretty good in his short 10 years in the past of you know, motorway schemes and yellow cab schemes and this scheme and that scheme. And so I, I think there could be some, some of that game played again. But, uh, but the big issues, I think, of the economy, um, as I mentioned, um, security of, is, 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 is the second one. You know, how do you tackle the extremist violence without greatly increasing the levels of violence in mm -hmm. Pakistan where the system is not pot potentially robust enough to uh, defend itself? So I think that will be an issue. I think the whole issue of civil-military relations, a lot of speculation of how that's going to go. We've, you know, Nawaz Sharif has had, had his run-ins in the past. Um, he's come back in a much stronger position than he's ever been before though now with this electoral mandate and what's he, what's he going to do with that in terms of you know i think strengthening civil military relations in a, a constructive way uh, my own guess is that you know i think in this in terms of as it relates to the foreign policy and and uh, i i can see making some headway on the indo-pac front um, which i think is the critical one in terms of potentially positive economic be benefits, which is, again, I think what he really needs to try to deliver on. Um, uh, I suspect he'll be probably doing a bit less on the Western Front or the AFPAC uh, uh, arena, where I think he, the, the military will probably continue to be playing the lead role on, on that issue. Um, and then finally, I think U.S.-PAC relations. I think we'll see what happens there. I mean, I think... Um, uh, you know, I think some of the initial noises have been positive. Um, uh, you, know, you know, I think the drone issue, which we'll hear more about later today, um, you know, could have a bearing on that. Uh, the whole drawdown of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, I think, you know, maybe not in the short term, that could also cause some tensions in the relationship, but in the longer term, having that issue um, being less um, uh, controversial, I think, uh, could be a... Um, provide some space to, for improved U.S.-Pakistan uh, relations, uh, uh, sorry, Pakistan, yeah, U.S.-Pakistan relations in terms of the Afghanistan issue. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that for now and leave you to it's sum it all up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I found myself during the course of the elections wishing that, you know, I had contracted out my analysis to Nate Silver because it was yeah. so complicated. And I, I expect that he probably would have said this I think we said. Um, but you know, I, I think the story of the elections is both actually quite simple and very complicated. Um, it was easy enough to predict that Nawaz Sharif would have won. Um, you know, as we've all said, over you know 50% of the seats are in Punjab um, for the National Assembly. But no one could have guessed that he would have won by so many. I mean, we, I had initially said that he could win up to 120. But I uh, calibrated my call when uh, Imran Khan fell off the stage. And, I had, and it's a bizarre thing to kind of change your mind about, but I was listening to people in Pakistan and what they were saying about this, and they themselves didn't really know what this meant and how it would translate um, into votes. But that was, I think, because we didn't know how Imran Khan in general would translate into votes and, and PTI's organization and what it meant um, for the election. So 
you know, a, a very kind of predominant unknown turned into several, you know, smaller unknowns, which made it very hard to um, predict what was going to happen. And you know, so while we all got our major call right, I think that many of the presumptions that we had to form that call didn't materialize. Um, but I thought that PTI would be able to steal from QMLN's base. Um, I thought that high voter turnout would actually, um, you know, could could actually hurt PMLN because, you know, if Imran could get these new voters out, then of course they would vote for him. And then, of course, you know, I, I thought that this would result in a messy um, coalition politics in a parliament that, you know, wouldn't be able to really govern and wouldn't be able to pass laws or reforms. And none of those things happened. And, you know, to me what that means is that we're, um, in this unknown territory where, um, you know, it, it's not just the personalities that have changed. So the new people are, have been introduced, we know them from before, but um, the institutions are changing. Citizens' voting behavior is changing. Um, the nature of political parties and how they're organized in Pakistan is changing, how they're reaching out to folks. I mean, social media is a perfect example of that. I mean, I was reading you know, Twitter to see how people were responding to Imran Khan, and that helped shape my analysis. Um, so we're, we're in this very unknown territory, and I think as Simbo mentioned, what, you know, what more unknowns are there out there that we um, can anticipate? Uh, we clearly don't have a good idea of you know, what's to come. Um, and also, I think the new three-party dynamic between PTI, PMLN, and PPP um, introduced a lot of confusion. There really isn't another third party like PTI in terms of its popularity. MQM has gotten significant number of seats in the past, and they've been able to serve as a spoiler in the parliament, come in and out of the coalition in the past government. But it, again, they don't have the popular appeal that someone like Imran Khan had. Um, so I think some of the discomfort in analyzing the elections was related to this new three-party dynamic, which I, I suspect will continue. Um, and I'm interested in seeing what this, um, you know, Imran's alleged base in Punjab and what, what his party does in KP, um, how that actually creates, uh, you know, a third base of constituents for these parties in, uh, in Pakistan. Um, the result of the election, I, I felt very good about it because of the relative stability that it would um, engender in, you know, in the government. Um, but I found myself, you know, having to, to, you know, caution, you know, my own views about being too optimistic um, and having to inject some realism in, in what I expect of the government. Uh, because at the end of the day, as you know, my colleagues have mentioned, the problems are still there and they're consistent. And they, you know, many governments in Pakistan have dealt with these problems. No one personality is going to be able to fix them. And I see several flashpoints um, that could develop um, into bigger challenges for the government over the next six months, um, if not sooner. Um, one is obviously the relationship that um, Sharif has with the military. Um, we can analyze it as much as we want. Um, I mean, there is clearly some bad blood there, some personal um, issues, and those things don't go away easily. So um, how is Sharif going to approach that? What trade-offs is he going to make? Um, will it feel better for him to maybe go after Musharraf, for example? Um, will that be a better kind of win for him personally, or is it better to let that go, not interfere, and you know, pursue a deepening of ties with the military leadership right now. That's a trade-off for him to, to, he has to make that decision. He also, have to, he also has to make a similar personal kind of versus professional decision when it comes to KP, where Imran Khan is going to be leading the government there. Um, they ran a very vicious campaign against PMLN, uh, very personalized, um, yet you know, Sharif is not going to be able to pursue any of his security policies, whatever they may be, without working closely with uh, you know, a PTI-led government in KP. Um, I also see relations with the United States as a potential flashpoint. Um, for the past year, I'd say they've, both sides have calmed down in terms of how they engage with, with each other publicly. The rhetoric has not escalated as much. There haven't been as many drone strikes. But there is still an unarticulated policy uh, between the United States and Pakistan for the future. We know that this is a very heavily CT security-based relationship, but we don't know what the you know what are the ties that bind these two countries together after 2014. It can't possibly be you know fighting Al Qaeda and Fatah until they're gone. So um, I think the so that's a broader kind of flashpoint. But the more short-term one is how does Nawaz Sharif approach this? Um, there are you know billions of dollars of a U.S.
coalition support funds, you know, they've been going into Pakistan. They will continue to go at least until 2014. Um, levels will go down after that. The, all of that money is contingent upon cooperation in, you know, the war in Afghanistan. So when there's no war, um, you know, what does the, the relationship will obviously change, but for the next year and a half, that's, that's a constant. So does Sharif actually go up against Imran Khan's commentary about drones and cooperation with the United States, or does he, you know, does he make a choice to privately side with the United States and you know, continue this cooperation, continue to let NATO trucks go through Pakistani routes? These are tough decisions that he's going to have to make, and I don't think that they're going to be easily done. Um, and then these, finally, the relationship with the militants. Um, you know, Pakistan has a long history of patronizing certain militant groups, some um, indirectly, some directly. Um, we know all of that is changing. That's another major transition that's going on in the country that um, uh, many of us who analyze uh, these developments don't really know which direction it's going to go. Um, and Sharif plays a very important role in that, primarily because when you know, going after the TTP and dealing with security in Fatah, for Sharif is probably going to mean, please stop you know, telling these groups to stop attacking Pakistanis. It might end there, right? And so I mean, is the United States, for example, going to be happy with that? How does that affect relationship with, uh, the relationship with Afghanistan? Um, I think those are potential flashpoints as well. And then also, if, you push, if Sharif pushes hard against militants in Fatah or KP, um, could there be backlash in his home base of Punjab? And how does he deal with that, where all of his constituents are and over 50% of the National Assembly seats are? So um, there, this is a pretty complex picture. and It's starting to make me think, you know, stability is not guaranteed, um, you know, 100%. Uh, so I hope that m in today's discussion, we can unpack some of these, you know, potential, potential flashpoints that we see down the road. Those were all brilliant uh, observations. To a factual question. Um, when was the last time a Pakistani government had this kind of mandate? 77? Yeah. 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 97. 97. 97. Yeah, Bhutto had like led to a martial law then. Yeah, but that was a very contested mm -hmm. uh, election. Bhutto's 97 Sharifs was Sharif a was big, big, like, you know, they had a big mandate yeah. even that time. Majority. Yeah. And yeah. what was the government able to do with the mandate then? I think the f first was uh, they got sanctions because of the nuclear tests happened and uh, so uh, quite quite immediately after coming into power with the heavy mandate they were faced with the economy which started sputtering mm. because of the sanctions happened and it slowed down but in the same time I think that is why we have the reputation of Ishaq Dar which we keeps on reverberating which, which now again Sharif is nominating as his finance minister. Their claim to fame is that, uh, his claim to fame and his team was that they tried to start fixing the economy while being sanctioned. And by the end of the term, when before uh, Musharraf, General Musharraf uh, ran over and uh, did that coup against Sharif, that they had fixed or stabilized the economy enough with less resources. Mm -hmm. So this is something that kind of stays in the memory in Pakistan mm -hmm. also. I. I, I need an economist to really do a you know firm analysis and see whether it was true. But that right. was the vision and that was the view that they were able to kind of fix and get the economy still moving along uh, while being sanctioned. So that's basically. I, I also think that many uh, were looking at the experience of the previous government, PPP, and how they spent they had to spend most of their time giving concessions to the smaller parties in the coalition to convince them to stay in the coalition. And that prevented them from you know, getting a consensus on other important issues like tax reform or you know, do we want an IMF program or you know, building co political consensus, basically. So the, the, you know, there was this overwhelming amount of attention devoted to just coalition politics and not real reforms. Well, well, another I, big, actually go ahead. One yeah. point on that, which I think is a big difference, though, from 97, is the 18th Amendment, where actually yeah. a lot more yeah. power. Explain what that is. A lot, the 18th Amendment, basically, um, one, returned Afghanistan to its original constitutional uh, structure of having more of a presidential, uh, parliamentary uh, form of government, but Pakistan. more, Pakistan. Pakistan, sorry. More importantly, um, it also then devolved a lot more substantive authorities to the provinces. And so now ru uh, ruling from the center um, is very different than it was uh, uh, you know, when Nawaz Sharif was last in power with a strong majority. So it's going to require a lot more 
compromising and dealing with the provincial governments and also, as pointed out earlier, with a lot fewer resources at the center because this NFC award, National Finance Committee award, has, g gives a lot more of the resources to the provinces to spend because they're now responsible for delivery of health and education and all these kind of services. So that would be a difference, yeah. So another sort of factual question is, what is the situation with the IMF? I mean, it, when, is there, when is the next negotiation round due? And, and what are they, you know, IMF negotiates with the Pakistani government have always involved sort of the same thing, which is we're going to do certain things, we're going to get people to pay taxes, we're going to cut subsidies. They never happen. Uh, what's your assessment of the IMF this time saying, hey, this is for real, you really, and in a way, the, the mandate that Nawaz has makes it easier to kind of accept some of these things, particularly if you can portray it as, you know, we're being forced to do this, there's no other option, if that's really the case. I think there'll be some tough discussions on that, but I think because the IMF has been putting off a lot of this because of it was election year and re realistically nothing was going to happen and I think there was no effort to really make too much happen. But now I think there are some real serious issues that need to be addressed. So I think that, you know, there's going to be some tough, we, tough discussions in the next IMF mission to Pakistan. Yeah, but I think just today or yesterday there was a news uh, that Nawaz Sharif government is already thinking of uh, delaying their approach to the IMF. Mm. Um, buying more time and because I think what they're talking about is that we have to do a far more deeper analysis of what we want to take to the IMF. <laughs> so this is this is the news. So they're not immediately going to the IMF. Uh, already you, you get an indication that they don't want to take the painful conditionalities that would come would mean going to the but IMF. But is there more taxes? Is there a but is there a deadline? I mean, it's it's not just the Pakistani government's decision right here. I don't it? I don't think there's no. a deadline there's except no for deadline. the, the whatever no deadline. deadline. I mean, it will be something but organic like we ran out of money. <laughs> right, right, okay, right, <laughs> right. And I think uh, for herein lies the problem. Simple said, they'll push it down the road. Yeah. Until they can't push it down the road yeah. anymore, and this is yeah. the this is a chronic issue with uh, Pakistan's economic policy making is that. It's very short term. It's sometimes month to month. You know, this month we're getting, we're probably going to get this much in remittances. We have these coalition support yeah. fund payments coming in, mm -hmm. and oh, you know, so we're okay right now. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, the, Pakistan owes a lot of money to the IMF. There's some big payments coming up. Even if Sharif maybe is able to get a big um, loan um, from the Saudis, for example, which mm. is within the realm of possibility. Whatever that amount is, I think historically the largest they've given is something like one billion, one point two billion. Yeah, that is still going to only take Pakistan for another few months. And the the type of program that the IMF would introduce now or six months down the road is going to have the same conditions that it had last year, same conditions that it had in previous programs. They're all heavily focused on tax reform and ge generating revenue. Like Andrew if said. I can just add to this, um, we are already. In, just to clarify, we are already within an IMF program. Pakistan yeah. is already has taken that loan. And now this whole talk about going to the IMF is actually because the government is facing a fiscal deficit. And uh, so they need to go back to the IMF if they really want those funds to get a little more fiscal space. Yeah. What they're saying is that we want to kind of look within and see if we can manage this fiscal space to know very clearly what how much they want to seek from the IMF, are there any other means or ways they can manage this fiscal deficit before they go to the IMF. Mm -hmm. And as far as those payments are coming up, the view right now within Pakistan is that those payments are, they are on schedule and they have enough to pay, make those payments. What, what size are we talking, what, what are the size of these loans? I think with seven and a half billion, the last loan that we are on, with, which we are, you know, kind of ongoing. And Pakistan needs about that every year, right, to keep afloat right now. I'm just doing sort of fuzzy math. But I mean, it, you're talking about the billion from the Saudis is not going to cut that's it. That's not a regular billion yeah. to the Saudis. Yeah, it's right, one, one off. It's one, one off. off. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That What's was the one off. plan to announce the next budget every year in the month of June, so they have to come to the budget. Mm. I mean, as a whole, Pakistan has had like a budget based on ad hocism, as uh, Shamayla was saying. So, yeah. What it, you know? In Sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we're, this is not peculiar to Pakistan. We have the same right. set of issues, Sorry. except uh, what about um, you know? In a, I guess in a, in a non-parliamentary system, Imran would have done much better. Is that am I right? I mean, in the sense, you know, if 
I mean, he was second everywhere, or not everywhere, but he was second in a lot of places. No, it was not an, uh, so in a, in a system that, was, that looked a little different, he might have got a much larger sort of share of the political pie. Was that correct? Well, I think it's also, if you had a proportional representation yeah. system, voter, voting system, he would have done much better. Yeah. You, Pakistan has a first-past-the-post voting yeah. system, which basically m militates against third parties emerging, um, which has its advantages and disadvantages. But, it, you know, so I think that's what really hurt him. But could, um, you know, help him the next time round. But I think this is where it's interesting. We were talking even beforehand, his decision to um, form the government in KPK, I think is a pretty high risk strategy because solving the problems in KPK is not going to be easy. Um, and, you know, again, we talked earlier that the liability of incumbency in, in Pakistani politics, that if he's perceived not to perform in KPK, um, the next time round, that could really hurt his chances. And if he had actually chosen to sit in opposition, where it's easier to shout and you know, make your speeches and not, not be tasked with delivery, um, the next round, he, he, I think he could have done better. But I think if he can deliver in KPK, then I think he you know, really could give, you know, put the PTI up into the top two parties in Pakistan. If, if raising taxes, raising revenue is difficult everywhere, and it may, it's going to be difficult in Pakistan, and then cutting subsidies is difficult everywhere too. So those, if you don't, if you don't want to touch those for one reason or another, then trade with India does look like a pretty attractive. It doesn't have the political cost domestically in a sense. So, Simbu, I was interested in your and what you said about the MFN because technically Pakistan has granted most favored nation to India. I, you know, why isn't that happening? And wouldn't, I mean, and maybe for you, Andrew, or, or anybody else, um, you know, at the end of the day, Nawaz is a business guy. He comes out of that sort of Punjabi business, you know, and th that's where the, it seems to be, well, that's the area where the most uh, momentum is for reaching out to India and, uh, and understanding that without attaching themselves to India, the Pakistan economy is just not going to, you know, there's, there's no magic solution except perhaps that. So c could we see, you know, some sort of, a, what are, you mentioned the non-tariff -tar barriers. I mean, what are the impediments right now to greater trade to in, with India and and how quickly do you think Nawaz will deal with it? Uh, Peter, I think uh, we, we need to kind of give a little bit more credit to the PPP. Basically, this mm. whole move towards opening with India, making sure. it again a central yeah. discourse in Pakistan. This happened about two years ago during the PPP time. I think it was 011 about after the, the famous incident in Aptabad, uh, Osama bin Laden. After that, there was this feeling in Pakistan that you know the whole neighborhood is becoming a little bit too uh, constrained for Pakistan and there was a need to kind of find a space of opening up with India and moving that way and it was easier to push that agenda somehow within Pakistan and PPP government has to be given credit for pushing it forward. During that time there was this huge move of delegations and trade delegations between India and Pakistan teams. There is a big issue uh, over the NTBs, which they call them the non-tariff barriers. Whatever, what it actually means that India has a, a very high tariff regime, which just doesn't apply to Pakistan, but applies to its trade with the, most of its neighbors and with other countries also. So these, are, there is uh, there is this huge lobby inside Pakistan, which is basically traders. It's less to do with politics. There are some trading houses. There are certain trading lobbies which feel that India should also make certain moves of reducing those barrier, uh, uh, trade barriers. And India is actually, uh, within, uh, within the SARC also, India is actually in discussions with some of its other neighbors, mm. Bangladesh, for example, and Sri Lanka, for example. They all have these issues with some of these NTBs with India. And but just hasn't give really an example. Is it, is it uh, protecting Indian ag agriculture, or what is it? It, it protects Indian cotton, uh, oh. um, you know, the, the, that sector, the cotton sector. It pr protects its agricultural sector. It's some kind of uh, other subsidies to certain in other sectors and Pakistani especially as you said Punjab and Nawaz Sharif party comes from Punjab and it's basically uh, big traders who are interested industrialists like Mansha who have uh, cotton export export not just a raw material but finished product export in cloth finished material cloth export to India and actually the trade barriers prevent that kind of uh, trade 
going uh, through from Pakistani side. It opens up for some other products, but we feel that Pakistanis feel that they have an advantage over within this, this sector of textile sector, which kind of closes it off. Uh, it's an uneven playing field for them. So mm. there is a discussion on this going on, but I personally feel that this is one sector as compared to say raising taxes or com trying to you know work on the energy sector as andrew said it's it's very difficult to deliver on that mm -hmm. sector this is one sector where if he moves you know takes these strong political mm -hmm. decisions and tries to work with those lobbies which are anti uh, you know uh, which which focus on this ntbs a little more this is one sector where he can get the space and deliver something tangible on mm -hmm. the ground which might help because it can also bring quick revenues to certain other constituencies especially through trans border uh, trade in punjabs so i think this is something that they should look into and move forward because this is far more easier than the other Mm -hmm. If I could just build on that, because I think the point that, yeah, PPP deserves credit, but more importantly, I think all the mainstream political parties, yeah. there's complete consensus on this issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that India was sort of a non-issue in the 2008 mm -hmm. elections, as well as this elections, except for a few of the Islamic parties. So there's a real opportunity of a political consensus to move this agenda forward. There are complicating things, like in all these things, there'll be winners and losers. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, Pakistan military is a important, pretty important corporate entity in Pakistan, and some of their sectors might be threatened by competition. But there, overall, it's clear that, that you know, there'll be more winners than losers. But to me, the interesting issue is I think that consensus is there now in Pakistan to move forward. Um, in some ways, the question, bigger question is, is there that consensus in India, mm -hmm. and especially as we're entering an election year in India. Mm -hmm. So I actually think for the next year, it might be difficult mm -hmm. to move forward uh, this agenda more because of the, the Indian electoral calendar. So. Shamala, on, on drones, um, you know, the president's going to make a speech today, and it's basically going to say that uh, you know, it's going to be a kind of more constrained drone program. We've seen a, a sharp reduction in the number of drone strikes in Pakistan. You know, when Nawaz was interviewed after the election, he said, he didn't say, I'm against drones. If you look at what he said, he said, I, we take this issue seriously. It's an issue of national sovereignty. We're going to look at it. So, I mean, what, just building on what you were just saying, it's possible that he kind of may, you know, I mean, what, what, how do you anticipate what he might do? I hope that he actually continues some of the good work that the PPP government did on this. And it, I'm not joking, actually. I think that the, the PPP did um, try very hard to normalize the security relationship with the United States. Um, before, um, you know, w when Musharraf was president, I mean, there was n there's no agreement. There, there's nothing on paper that mm -hmm. identifies the terms post 9-11 for the U.S. and Pakistan um, security relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of money going in there. There are these drone strikes. And the, the PPP acknowledged that. And, you know, as a democratic government had to kind of justify or sell certain moves with the U.S. Um, to the parliament and to other you know, political stakeholders. And they weren't able to because there is nothing on paper. This was a cloak mm. and dagger relationship. And uh, I think the democratization of Pakistani politics really pushed for something more. Um, and they took that on. Uh, you know, they, 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 you know, parliament got involved in the post Salalo review. That never had happened before, really, that level of oversight on U.S.-Pakistan relations. It was, I think, a no-go zone for a while. I hope that the parliament will continue to, even if it's just um, in spirit, if there's nothing coming out of it, I hope that they would uh, continue to have a voice on security issues. It probably won't be at the benefit of the United States, though. <laughs> I think that, that that's really the, the concern, I, I think, for the United States is that uh, more democracy on security issues and more collaboration between civil and military institutions in Pakistan won't be uh, won't necessarily advance their interests. It's going to be critical the next one and a half years. My sense is that the United States will want to pursue, to continue to pursue an aggressive and kind of open approach to the security situation in Pakistan, simply because the posture in Afghanistan is going to be smaller, the resources will be less. So the ability to do things, if you want to do something, you got to do it in the next year and a half. Otherwise, it's going to become, become a different type of relationship in a different scenario. And a lot of the funding to Pakistan will decrease as well. So um, I think it's critical for Sharif to um, do a lot of this as privately as he can, because I think politically it will be hard for him to sell it. And uh, you know, Pakistanis are getting killed in this. Um, so it's not like he can just ignore the United States. I mean, these groups are attacking the military, the state, 
and Pakistani citizens. So there's some level of coordination with the United States is necessary, and I, I hope that the parliament won't take uh, you know, just a non-aligned approach. I mean, that wouldn't be good for any of them. Mm. Let's open it up to questions. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, uh, identify yourself, wait for the mic, and uh, here is the mic coming. We'll start in the back with Samir Lawani, who's a research fellow here, a PhD candidate at MIT. So I've identified you. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to uh, jump into the question that's been discussed about uh, taxation. So there seems to be a consensus that Pakistan needs to raise its taxation in some capacity to raise revenue. Uh, and then there's always sort of the story that there's entrenched interest well, that, well, that will always block it. So I'm wondering, even though this is a low probability event, what the possible pathway might be for raising of taxes? Is it more likely that industrialists will sort of bandwagon together to try to raise taxes on large landlords? Is it more likely that you just sort of have to like rely on a VAT and increase the VAT in some way because it's more dispersed? What are the plausible scenarios for this to happen? Yeah, and I think real estate tax might be the easiest and most, I mean, theoretically, because it's, the, it's the hardest to hide. Well, in the past, it's sort of viewed that Nawaz Sharif's main constituency was urban, Punjab, small traders and industrialists, uh, and that the PPP was more the party of the feudals. And so, therefore, agricultural tax would be more likely under a PMLN-led government. I mean, I think that's overly simplistic because there's feudals and industrialists now in all the, all, all the parties. But I think that that would be a pretty you know, logical place to start. Um, uh, that if it's going to happen, I don't know. But I do think that the wiggle room to kick this one down the road too much further, I think, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical that they can, I, I, I think now th there's going to be little choice but to address it. How well that's addressed, how, you know, how far they go, I don't know. But I think we will see some progress on this issue uh, during, uh, under, under this government. Because I, I, I don't think, again, back to the IMF issue, I don't think that they can, carry on kicking the, kicking the can down the road on this issue. Gentleman here in front. Call me an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> oh. no, thank you. Um, Symbol, uh, this question is Could directed. Could you identify yourself? Sorry. Oh, I'm Tarek Shafi, uh, civilian. Um, Symbol, this is directed to you. You mentioned very briefly in the passing judicial activism. And uh, from my perspective, Judicial activism is to be lauded, I guess, when they go against the diktats of dictators and so on. But now that we have a popularly elected government, a civilian government uh, with a mandate, let's say, do you think now the high court and the uh, lower courts will start ruling from the bench rather than interfering in the civilian governance? I think it's valid criticism and th there's a lot of discussion going on on that this particular issue within Pakistan within the media and the public space but I think the, uh, why for me it's still a problem of course we we all lauded the judicial activism judiciary became a judiciary for the first time during Musharraf's time and how it actively kind of supported the overthrow of Musharraf government and reinstitution of the civilian uh, process in Pakistan and then um, now past five years we've seen the judiciary kind of intervening in various civil matters of the government and PPP government against Zardari, against the sitting prime ministers. Why I think it still finds some resonance in Pakistan overall, when you talk to the Pakistanis within Pakistan, it is viewed quite positively, it's not viewed negatively. Why? Because due to this uh, systemic, uh, systemic uh, cleavage that we've had in Pakistan, where you had civil and military governments kind of shifting away, which, which not just affects the, the, the running of the government at the center, it actually shuns and shifts the system quickly. It has weakened civil institutions. It has weakened political party structures themselves. So every time you have a new system, civilian system step in into power or you have that process unfold, there are anomalies in that system. There are predatory, some of the, uh, these political parties, political actors, even the parliament at some point is viewed generally as predatory by the people. The, the levels of corruption in the PPP government at that point was so predatory, was so obvious that unless there is a check and balance, and you know, we know that and you know that, in the past, in the 90s, for example, because there was no judicial check and balance there, it was usually the militaries which took that role in. When Musharraf stepped in, it was saying, oh, because these civilian guys are corrupt, and you know, Saifur Rahman and Nawaz Sharif's government is looting the exchequer, so that's why we've brought this military government. And it would find, 
find support, popular support for a while at least, because people were fed up of the predatory uh, political actors. So I feel in a wave, at least for a time being, maybe not as a permanent feature of this activism, this creates a bit of a, s a safety valve in the system, where what the judiciary ends up doing is pressuring the, 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 uh, the executive or the civilian uh, parliament and prevents the military from doing that. So in a way, we, uh, I know it's not a perfect situation and so many times they have overstepped their uh, you know, kind of mandate and they've created problems for the civilian government. But looking at Pakistan's history, I don't think it's altogether an unwanted element for this time. Just wow. one comment on top of that. But it has politicized the judiciary and it's increased, true. It's yeah. increased a perception on the outside, for example, with foreign investors, of an added risk factor in the d domestic you know, politics, which is already very complicated. And mm -hmm. so when you have the chief justice making decisions on privatization cases, cases that involve foreign companies in Baluchistan, I mean, this is, yeah, yeah. All, all kinds of things. Is it better to have an intrusive military or an intrusive That's judiciary? Right. <laughs> 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 I mean, is that the choice? What but I'm trying to I say. I mean, that shouldn't be the choice. Or predatory yeah. government. <laughs> yeah, predatory <laughs> government. It has a lot to do with uh, Chief Justice Eftahar Chaudhary's celebrity status. The way when he is he retiring, by the way? This uh, year? This year. This year. Yeah. So, so and, what, what, and do we know who will replace him? Yes. I hope Musharraf, uh, Musharraf will replace him. <laughs> <laughs> Sharif, Sharif well. will not try to interfere the way he did in 1997. He tried to he replace the army chief. He yeah. wanted to replace the chief justice. So, so wait, sorry, just a point of clarification. We know who the new chief justice right. is. Not the senior most. Senior, senior, senior most. Okay. okay. And, and, and is he? A, there's a good right. cast. I'm presuming that's yeah. a he. It's a, it's it's a, it's a, a yeah. It's so it's will he be as intrusive as Chowdhury has uh, been, or? I don't think so. I think the expectations were very high from uh, the Chief Justice. It was a two-year-long campaign across the country by the civil society to induct him. So uh, when uh, he just ran his campaign, just like a po politician, you know, he said, okay, if I'm re-inducted, I will pick up the issue of enforced disappearances. I would, uh, you mm. know, pick up the human rights issues. So he became a celebrity. When he uh, became the Chief Justice, he just began to, like, in intrude into every government affairs. And there was a time when people realized that, as you uh, talked about it, you know, besides the military, there was a new power center. You know, the chief justice began to meddle into the affairs of the parliament, into the affairs of the government. And uh, people say that, okay, Pakistan had an, an uninterrupted democracy, but the prime minister was kicked out by the chief justice. I think it was the job for the, uh, for the parliament to decide whether the prime minister was qualified or disqualified. But the Chief Justice was too intrusive, and it gave uh, you know rise to speculations whether uh, after the military the uh, judiciary has become a power center. But I think it will eventually fade away because Maybe. Chief Justice Chaudhary was a celebrity, and the next Chief Justice would uh, be in different circumstances. I agree with Siraj that it's you know his personality and his personal trajectory of how he came into being the the figure that he became eventually his struggle with. Uh, uh, Musharraf, all that is definitely a factor, and that might fade away with. But I think the activism of the judiciary is a wider process. I don't think it is. We should have. We look. We should look at it completely in a personalized kind of a capacity, just linked with him. He, of course, became a figurehead on top, and he that kind of segued into a lot. But I think now the judicial activism, the way the ECP and the Election Commission we saw structure and how the judiciary was acting. It has become something institutionalized, and we will see a far more aggressive, far more active judiciary for some time to come. I don't how, think. How it's good going was the media coverage at the election? Pretty good. I Pretty think the social good, media yeah. was the biggest uh, change in Pakistani media. Uh, for the first time, the PTI inducted a trend of uh, using social media and. Yeah. But I'm talking the about the, the TV, the newspapers, the radio. It was, it was huge. It was It was, big. Prof it was professionally it covered. Was overwhelming, yeah. I thought it was, yeah, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Peter, I, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit of a Luddite, I have to admit. Yeah. Even I signed up for a Twitter account to follow the election. <laughs> so the day before the election. So. Yes. This gentleman here. I'm uh, Tom Green, a retired Foreign Service officer. I was in Pakistan for four years. A couple of his, uh, you mentioned Baluchistan. I wonder if you could say something about the insurgency there, what the government is doing, and how and where the funding. We have one of the world's leading comes. experts right here. So go ahead. Siraj. Well, uh, the election <laughs> result uh, outcome in Baluchistan was 10 percent, barely 10 percent. Uh, one a candidate won like 543 votes to become a member of the parliament. 
The separatist movement is trickled down to the middle class in Balochistan. People are extremely annoyed. They don't have faith in the parliamentary system in Pakistan. So the separatist political parties called for a massive boycott. I was talking to my dad, and he's like, I've never seen such a massive boycott, or uh, it's just like a curfew-like situation in 60 years of his life. So uh, the Pakistani government doesn't uh, open up, doesn't talk about the situation in Balochistan. Even the Pakistan People's Party did promise to uh, address the issue of the Baloch uh, insurgency and Baloch grievances. But a lot of human rights abuses were committed by the Pakistani government. Thousands of people have disappeared. and you, they, they all disappeared during Musharraf's time. But for the first time during the People's Party government, hundreds of those missing persons, their bullet riddled dead bodies were found. So there was a lot of anger. Well, and in 2008, the Baloch Nationalist Parties had boycotted. This time, they went back. They ended their boycott. But the separatist uh, forces were so popular that, that there was no sympathy vote for the Baloch Nationalist Parties. So uh, th there was no vote. Uh, uh, and then uh, another unfortunate part of it is, you see, the central parties, whether that's the Muslim League or the People's Party or the military, have no respect for the local mandate of Balochistan. In 2008, for example, the People's Party was not in the majority, but the People's Party bought off votes of independent candidates to form its own government. This time, again, the Pashtun Nationalist Party, Pakhtun Khwa Emili Awami Party, won the majority. But Nawaz Sharif is trying to meddle into the you know, government formation process. They are trying to have their own chief minister. So there is a sense of betrayal, again, in Balochistan that the elections did not help them all. And after the elections, just two days back, at least five more young political activists' dead bodies were found. So for the Baloch, there is no difference, you know, whether it's uh, uh, the military government, it's the People's Party, or the uh, PML in, in, in power, you see. The military controls Balochistan. There is a core commander of the military and the inspector general of the Frontier Corps. They are more powerful than the chief minister and the governor. So uh, uh, there is no civilian authority in Balochistan, and I think Nawaz Sharif has to look into it. It's a very serious problem. Okay. This gentleman here. Hi, Patrick Schneider uh, from a trade consulting firm in DC. I'm wondering a little bit about the, the US Pakistan relation. Um, I, kinda, I understand the issues, but does Sharif's selection really concretely change any aspect of the relationship, or what's kind of the U.S. perspective on Sharif's selection as opposed to, you know, one of the other candidates? Start with Shamila, and then we'll on a symbol, so she's writing a book about it. I, yeah, no, <laughs> and no, and no, you were the NSC really director great, for Pakistan. Great research, former, <laughs> former. <laughs> but, but former. I, I think it's actually more. Sim it's simple, not complicated. It doesn't change much because U.S. interests in Pakistan are fairly consistent. Uh, especially over the next year and a half. Um, as what, what are those interests? Well, the, you know, domestically, I think political stability and economic stability in Pakistan is important to the United States because um, if, if an unstable government in Pakistan could potentially make, uh, you know, the U.S. effort in Afghanistan and, the, you know, dealing with the security issue in Fatah harder, mm -hmm. um, the government will be you know, distracted by very real challenges and the, you know, problems with the U.S. and they are problems are kind of lower on, become lower and lower on the list. And we saw that happen in the lead up to the elections, um, you know, and well before that, I think for a year now. But once the campaigning informally started, I mean, no one was talking about U.S., the U.S. relationship in Pakistan. It was a non-issue. Um, so because it's so bad. Well, because it had gotten so bad, and then it became kind of flat, flatlined, and no one wanted to talk about it publicly because it was too controversial and it would cause problems. And I think in Pakistan there were more important issues, you know, yeah. the election and um, energy and domestic issues became, uh, you know, what people talked about. Um, I don't, I don't think, um, and, and other U.S. interests. I mean, you, you know, there's senior Al Qaeda leadership living in Fatah. Um, there are fewer of them now than there were before, uh, but. There are still operations and attacks being, you know, potentially planned against American targets. Um, so that's a, I think that's an enduring interest actually for the United States uh, beyond 2014, um, because those groups have stronger relationships with, um, say, criminal networks based in Karachi, southern Punjab, um, sectarian groups. Um, so we don't. It's not clear to us how the ideolo ideologies and agendas of those of secondary actors are changing and they could become more anti-American. So I actually, I think that the U.S. will have some kind of sustained uh, approach to your know, relationship with Pakistan based on security, but it's... Don't forget the nukes. And then the nukes. <laughs> and that was going to be my final point. I'll turn to symbol. Let's not forget the nukes. I mean, this focus on Al-Qaeda post 9-11, it's 
it's temporary because Al Qaeda has already started to move. You know, there's it, places for them to go in the Middle East, um, you know, pl other places to go in the region, and um, it hasn't been entirely comfortable for them, as we all know, in Pakistan in recent you know recent times. So after that, you're left with Pakistan's nukes, and the U.S. interest there is. Um, you know, I think sometimes this is an irrational fe fear. It's not likely, but if you're a government, you have to be considerate of the of these things happening. A loose nuke scenario where you, you know, it's. It, I don't think the Pakistani government. Anyone thinks the Pakistani government is going to give their nukes to terrorists. No one ever thinks that. But because there are um, several risk factors in the security environment, there are militant groups that sometimes talk to the government, sometimes don't. They have bad relations with the government. The, those nuclear weapons could be threatened. They, Potentially, I think, right? Well, I, I've always thought that it is completely implausible that a terrorist group, for any reason at all, could acquire a Pakistani Absolutely. nuclear weapon. But oh, what I is agree. much more plausible <coughs> is that a terrorist group could provoke a nuclear war right. between India yeah. and Pakistan. Right. And that's that seems fear. like a much more that's, reasonable. That's the fear. And I mean, no one wants this region to go up in yeah. to, to flames like that. And that interest for the United States is enduring for yeah. sure. I think yeah. Considering the, um, uh, the image Pakistani military has within Pakistan that it's the most organized institution, it is there to guard the national frontiers. Uh, three attacks took place during the People's Party government even for which we were not prepared, you see. Uh, for example, bin Laden was found somewhere in the Pakistani version of the West Point in Abbottabad. That was something no one was prepared for. Th then there was an attack the Pakistani general's headquarters which was our version of the Pentagon. And the attackers were there for 23 hours. You see, there was an attack on Pakistani naval headquarters. There was an attack on Pakistani Air Force headquarters. These are smaller attacks, you know. But again, Pakistani citizens, their trust was shattered. They were mm. taken aback, you know, uh, how weak their military could be in terms of guarding its own interests. So considering all that, you know, uh, because the reason is all these attacks do take place time and again, because within the Pakistani military, there are elements supportive of Islamic extremist groups. And uh, th one would not you know, rule out the possibility of the Islamic groups trying to control Pakistani nukes or getting into the Pakistani nuclear installations, which may not be like uh, something that will happen in the next five years. But I think Pakistani military has to s strictly check the elements within the military that have been so uh, supportive of the Islamic elements, including the Abbott Abad Red. I can just first of all start with what Siraj has talked about, uh, this issue about you have also referred this danger to the Pakistani nukes falling into the hands of the, uh, of the Taliban or falling into the hands of the Al-Qaeda. I think uh, I agree with you, Peter, that the real danger is what we, what, you know, George Perkovich, I think, who is, has said it the best is about this, this whole issue about subconventional threat in South Asia where non-state actors can strike, uh, uh, strike or start a nuclear war between India and Pakistan like we saw, you know, we, both the countries coming to the brink during the Bum Bum Mumbai crisis. But what Siraj is talking about, I think, as far as these nukes and, of course, a lot of Pakistani military installations have been under threat. They've been attacked in Karachi, in Rawalpindi, in Kamra, all those bases have been attacked. And that danger remains, I mean, that shows you that the internal military stress, um, threat is so big that even the most uh, well secured areas are uh, kind of open to these attacks. But when you're talking about nukes and the way nuclear materials are stored and kept and the, the command and control, that's a totally different regime altogether. I, I couldn't agree with uh, yeah, you. Yeah, totally different it's, regime. It's not like we, in the movies. We, where exactly. You, you, go so, in you know, you kind of conflating those. <laughs> yes, they can go in and hit the F-16s and blow a few planes there and damage some equipment, which they have done. They damage very expensive planes that Pakistan had bought. But this whole, you know, kind of conflating it as if that the nuclear uh, materials are just put there in a container and the militants are going to run in for 23 hours and run out with them, it's a little bit ludicrous. Answer to that question uh, there in the back about the U.S.-Pakistan relations, I agree with Shamila. For the last 10 years, they've been too Afghan-centric and of also counter-terror-centric. I think that centricities have, have gone on for the last 10 years. But as this whole engagement, U.S. own engagement in Afghanistan is changing, and also on counterterrorism, there is this whole process that we see unfolding within the U.S. about what it means, what is the counterterror strategies related to drones or related to other special forces, and what is going to be the residual presence in Afghanistan is going to be like, whether it's going to be an active presence, whether it's going to be just supportive training mission. 
all these issues, as that changes, I think the view here also and this relationship between US and Pakistan is also changing and shifting. And also agree with Shamila that of course, uh, this, this view, this centrality of the nuclear issue, Pakistan, not just Pakistan, India and Pakistan, two countries which have got a, a horrible history of, of relations last 60 years. They are nuclear countries which are side by side and where there is no geographic, uh, you know, kind of insularity between them. Mm -hmm. It is an area that is going to be critical to global security, not just to the U.S., to the, to the world, which always are, is going to be an area which the U.S. needs to engage and will engage. And I think this view now in my, my own, as Peter discussed a little bit about my project that I've been doing, working on, and then what part of my project has been how I've structured it, I've done a series of uh, interviews with people, policymakers, starting from Bush era to now at the, at, at, at the State Department level, Pentagon, DOD, almost every level. And the view that's coming out from most of the people that I've interviewed is that, yes, Pakistan's centrality, there is, there is no way that the U.S. can take its eyes off the, the ball there. The view is going to change, the relationship is changing and shifting. And uh, I think the, the, how you will see a clarity is when the U.S. starts enunciating a larger policy on South Central Asia region, which is, I think, not really very clearly enunciated. Mm -hmm. But the, this realization is definitely there that Pakistan is a country of 200 million people in a very critical, geopolitically, a very critical part of the world. And that interest is going to continue. Can I say that one additional comment is I, I absolutely agree with Simbal that the, the experts who are looking at Pakistan, um, are, I think there's a lot of consensus on the importance of Pakistan. We can't uh, you know, take our eyes off the ball. However, that's a very, very, very small group. And, and, and what, Congress is completely and What the strikes me yeah. here as someone who's spent much of my life working in and on in Pakistan, how little interest there is in Pakistan this country. And of course, Pakistan's not done itself a lot of favors in this regard in terms of you know, the perceived relationship of the last few years in particular. But that said, it is important, and yet there is very little expertise in the U.S. on Pakistan. There is not a new generation of scholars studying Pakistan in America. Someone gave me a statistic Samir. recently. <laughs> of, there's like 40 or 50 <laughs> students in all of America studying Urdu, you know, compared to you know, tens of thousands in Arabic and probably hundreds of thousands in Chinese. But, yeah. but again, given its importance for U.S. national security, um, it's quite striking and frightening how little interest there is amongst the public and at large in Pakistan. So, uh, we, we have about three minutes left. Um, so does anybody else have any questions? This gentleman here at the back. Hello, it's Salim from Dunya News. Uh, in the post-election analysis that I've uh, attended and read, uh, most people are calling a Nawaz Sharif government more uh, a right-wing government or uh, Tariq Insaf being a right-wing government in KPK. But don't you think these lines between left and right have sort of blurred in the last 10 years in Pakistan? Because if you look at the People's Party government or the ANP government during last five years, uh, People's Party didn't do anything on the blasphemy law. In fact, when Governor Tasir was killed or when Ambassador Rahman introduced an amendment in the parliament, the party disowned them. Uh, uh, Bashir Bilor, uh, uh, rather, his elder brother, who was a federal minister, he uh, announced a bounty on uh, uh, the maker of uh, the film uh, that uh, caused Benghazi. Uh, whereas Nawaz Sharif, on the other hand, is uh, talking about uh, opening up to India and uh, uh, not uh, sort of uh, falling for the anti-drone rhetoric. So uh, what are your opinions on that? Um, I I agree with you the fact that you know these these sharp lines by with what we say is left of center and right of center are kind of blurring in not just in Pakistan I think they're kind of blurring all over the world you know since since the fall of the Soviet Empire and the fall of communism those lines are blurring but when we when we talk in Pakistan's context and when you say Nawaz Sharif is slightly right of center uh, party, PMLN is more of a right of center party and P PPP, for example, is more of a left of center party. I think what is meant and what people refer to, and I myself refer to, is basically the social programs that they have 
put forward. If you look at the social program, if you look at, for example, uh, PPP's social agenda that they've had, the social welfare, the BISP program, the Benazir Income Support program that you, that, you know, became a very big part of PPP's kind of social agenda and they've, they've followed it through whether, you know, we agreed it with not. It has been thoroughly criticized within Pakistan and outside Pakistan. It has also had its proponents also, but it's basically the idea about providing a social kind of a basic social network to the poorest people. It is a kind of a leftist, more left-leaning agenda, social agenda. I don't think PMLN has anything of that sort. Then as a woman, I, I have no qualms in saying I find PPP's social agenda more women's, women centric, more, you know, kind of uh, forward looking as far as women are concerned, creating more space for women creating more visibility for women than, say, PMLN agenda. So in, in some of these very small examples, I would say that, you know, that there are these blurring lines which, which you still can see them on their social agenda. And similar agendas exist, but of course, PPP didn't have the courage to push their agenda. I mean, that's a total uh, different issue, you know, how parties get that courage to push the agenda which they themselves are putting forward in their uh, party manifestos. But on the books, that's how it looks for me. It looks to me. Very quickly, anybody else? I, I think maybe you're talking more about the foreign policy issues, and I think because of all of these, yeah. the military, the yeah, parties, yeah, yeah. the politicians, they're all fa facing the same threats, the same challenges in resolving these foreign policy challenges. So there's clearly more centrist approach to dealing with the external problems. I think. I think all of these issues need long-term engagement. Pakistan and it is underwent drastic changes in the textbooks, which were filled with a lot of hateful material, you know. There was Islamization of the textbooks. So overall, the Pakistani politics is, uh, whether the People's Party or the Muslim League have used political Islam, you know, to enhance their, uh, uh, you know, power. So it's, it, you, you can't have overnight, you know, uh, s solutions to these problems in terms of empowering women, in terms of reducing hatred towards India or having a more open policy towards the United States. You have to uh, revamp the textbooks. You have to, you know, open up Pakistan. You have to liberalize the education system. So it requires at least a decade or two decades engagement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Shamila, Andrew, Siraj, Symbol, thank you. That was all. It was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.